Welcome everyone to um, our newest session of the um, CCA seminar series and the first after our uh, very long uh, break over the summer where we were very busy running our summer school and um, other events and I'm very happy that we are back um, and very happy to have um, Professor Victor Greif today but um, I leave the introduction to uh, Dr. Dino Oglitch who will I'll tell you everything about our speaker you need to know. Um, please stay on mute for the duration of the sessions. If you have questions, um, just put them down in the chat and we will call you up at the end um, so you can ask your question to, to uh, Professor Greif. And I'm very much looking forward to the session. So, Dino, over to you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Victor Greif, who is a professor in the System Immunology at the University of Oslo. Uh, his group develops uh, machine learning, computation, and experimental tools for immune repertoire based uh, in silico immune diagnostics and immunotherapeutic discovery and design. He's president of the Norwegian Society for Immunology and the chair of uh, AIR Community. Victor received his PhD uh, in systems immunology from Humboldt University in Germany and did his uh, postdoctoral uh, studies at ETH Zurich. He is the expert in the antibody engineering uh, and simulations. So, uh, Victor, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks so much for having me today. We'll be talking today about simulation and machine learning approaches um, for biologics design. And I would like to preface this um, talk also with um, acknowledgement of my uh, dear colleague um, Gechiedo Sanve, um, with whom I am uh, developed a lot of the work that I will be showing you today. So I will um, just briefly introduce the adaptive immune system to you, uh, which you all got to know quite well over the last years due to the pandemic. Um, but this is kind of the main biological area of my work. So um, I will just, yeah show a bit the main parts that we will be talking about now. Um, so if uh, so once a virus or bacteria or cancer or autoimmunity um, affects our body, the adaptive immune system is, is activated and the adaptive immune system is mainly composed of um, B and T cells. And they have um, B and T cell receptors. Um, which bind specifically to, to, to these antigens here shown in red. Uh, and um, the main sign or the main property of the adaptive immune system is um, immune history. So over time, um, um, uh, these antigen encounters that we have um, that we have encountered um, over the over our lifetime, basically they get stored in um, adaptive um, immune memory, which can be seen as a USB drive, basically. So that's the principle of uh, vaccination. So uh, when we get vaccinated, the next time around, we can um, react at a um, at a higher amplitude and a faster um, pace against um, these antigens that have infected us. Um, how can we get access to these immune receptors? So because we would like to understand the diversity of how they bind this, this, this antigen, because by learning how they can bind this antigen, we can make new drugs such as monoclonal antibodies, therapeutic antibodies that can um, that we can give to cancer patients or to immune patients um, infectious disease patients to so to look at the sequence diversity of these immune receptor repertoires um, high throughput sequencing is employed so we just isolate these cells and we um, sequence the RNA or DNA of of B and T cells, which then gives us access to the um, immune receptor sequence, which is about 100 amino acids long. Unfortunately, the sequence does not really tell us what antigen they are binding. So, and this will be the major part of my talk to understand, to, to predict from the immune receptor sequence what the cognate antigen is or cognate antigens, as we will see. 
So just to really make this problem quite clear, I will show you the complexity of the system that we're working with. So these um, B and T cells, that we have just seen, and, and so this, uh, which bear these um, T cell receptors and antibodies on their surface, um, they are made by a um, process called VDJ recombination. So each B and T cell, when they are in the bone marrow, um, there are different V gene sec V um, different germline gene segments, as they're called V, D, and J, and they get pseudo randomly recombined to form the antibody. Um, or T cell receptor binding site, which is about 100 amino acids long, but only a small portion, this complementarity determining region three, um, is really important for antigen binding. And that's only, that, that's maybe uh, 15 to 20 amino acids long. And this process um, is uh, so complex that it can um, make sequences of the order of um, more than 10 to the 13 different sequences of which we have about 10 to the 10 to 11 in our body at any one time. And they differ across individuals. So each of us has different um, a different set of this, um, so a different subset of this um, superset. And since immune receptors um, can encode the immune history of what we have encountered over our, over our lifetime, there, is the, um, there was this thought that, okay, if we sequence these immune receptors, so these B and T cell receptors, uh, B cell receptors are, are also called antibodies, and I will call them interchangeably um, from now on. Um, there is this dream that by just looking at the sequences, we can predict which um, persons are healthy and which are diseased. And so this is this um, this is also called immune receptor diagnostics. And on the sequence level, we would like to predict um, which antibodies can bind a given antigen. So for example, SARS-CoV-2 or a cancer antigen, in order to then make in a predictive in silico fashion immunotherapeutics. And this is a very hot market since it is has been shown, I mean, in clinical studies and it's used readily in the clinic that monoclonal antibodies really um, um, can cure cancers that before were uncurable. So this is a huge market um, uh, growing several billions per year and every pharma company or every big pharma company is working on several of those biologic drugs. And we would like to make them by a machine learning or computational approaches, since for now, the experimental development can take a decade. And it would really be great to, um, to shorten the developmental um, timeframe. So what are the specific machine learning challenges when we um, deal with these immune receptor sequences? And this is really different from um, genetic um, data sets because um, for, mo for genetic data sets, all of us have the same genes, just maybe different alleles, but overall our genetic setup is kind of the same or very similar, whereas really there is very low overlap across our antibody setups. And we would like to look at, um, at, at, at which diseases are encoded in our immune memory, which can be many. And um, counterintuitively, the signal that relates to a given previous or current disease or infection might be very small. So it's a very low signal. And then what comes um, on top of that is that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between um, antigen or disease and our immune receptors, there is a many-to-many -many relationship. So each antibody can bind to many different antigens and can be bound by many different antigens. And there is diversity in how the immune signal can occur in terms of um, number of cells or on the sequence or structural level. And there can also be confounding effects, which, which mostly um, occur via... Um, um, sex, genetic background, 
um, age. So as we age, our immune repertoires change also, and that needs to be accounted for when we want to use these data sets for disease prediction. And and then there is a and then there is a very large unsolved field also, which is technological effects that can overshadow the already small biological signal. So just to make clear what the machine learning um, problem for, for example, the diagnostic use case would be. So we um, so the dream would be that you that from a given person. We, we would take um, a blood sample, then we would sequence those immune receptor sequences so that we would get large scale data sets. And then these data sets, so here a different color would be a different disease group. So for example, let's imagine this is HIV, SARS-CoV-2 and healthy. And you would like to find those patterns in the immune receptor sequences that predict blue um, and yeah, green and cyan uh, blue. And the problem is that, as I said before, each individual has a different set of receptor sequences. And, and, and these blue sequences that might relate to the disease status might be different across individuals. And finding common patterns across individuals that relate to a given underlying immune state, um, such as, for example, a common infection, is really really difficult. So it's um, yeah. So you have so it's not like you have all the same documents and there are just minor changes in those documents. You're trying to find common patterns across um, very different documents. So it's not like um, what we say in our field. You're not looking for a needle in a haystack. You're looking for a needle in a needle stack because you don't even know what kind of needle you are looking for. Um, yes, and then uh, the, um, and then of course, it is not the future use case is not that one individual has only one disease, right? Each individual has a number of previous diseases or current immune states that we would like to classify. So it's a multi-label problem also. And for the immune, uh, so for the sequence level machine learning use case, it's it's really the problem that we want to predict binding. And here the problem is that this is that this occurs in the in a 3D space. And the binding in, the binding interface between antibody and antigen is called paratope and epitope. And as you see here, the interacting residues can be may, maybe close in the 3D space, but apart um, so distant in the sequence space. So it's kind of a, not even a gapped camera. It's, it's um, yeah, it's um, long range distances that you need to kind of bring together in terms of motifs. And then the use case would be that we would like to predict where the antibody would bind um, on the antigen. So if it would bind anywhere and then, and if yes, where? And then also in terms of design, that we design vaccines, for example, such that they are bound by our um, naive antibody repertoire. So there are many different use cases that one could look at. So for now, I'm just going to focus on the um, diagnostics level, where, as said before, we would like to classify, based on a set of sequences, is this person healthy or diseased? And there is a very classical paper in our field, and it's one of the few papers where this principle has been really shown that this can work. So here they had about 300 individuals that were um, positive for, um, for the CMV virus. This is a virus that almost all of us have. It's, it's, it's mostly, it mostly doesn't do anything, but um, once you get uh, maybe immunosuppressed, then it can really be bad for you. But most of the time it doesn't do anything or much um, as far as we know. And then we have also about 300 negative individuals. And then just the question was, can we predict um, CMV positive versus negative based on the sets of sequences of a given individual. And what these people could show in 2017, that um, yes, this can be done with a very high accuracy of 90% or something like that. 
But um, the fun fact here is really that this is one of the few papers where this has been shown. And this might also have to do with the fact that there are not so many large scale studies where you have um, a lot of, um, of these large scale data sets where you have hundreds of samples per given immune state. And in order to um, really unify different machine learning approaches um, in this space, both um, for the um, both for the um, diagnostics use case and also the biologics discovery use case, we developed this immune this um, framework called ImmuneML, which is um, which is both um, command line and graphical user interface. Um, a platform for um, immune receptor adapted machine learning approaches. Um, yes, I would just and and with that um, and in that paper we took again this um, CMB study that I just showed you from 2017, and we show that um, the high accuracy. So the full data set, which is gives here an AUC of 0 0.92, can only be reached really with the full data sets. So you see when we go, if we had, um, so this is about 300 um, positive, 300 negative. If we go to 200, 200, then it drops already. And if we go to um, a third of the data set, of the um, full data set, then we are at um, random. So if we had... Um, only a third of the experimental data, we would have said that um, we cannot classify by um, virus status, although biologically that would have been incorrect. So this shows that it's really important to understand that the signal is really, really low, and you need a lot of examples to find these very small patterns that unify a certain class versus another class. <clears throat> Um, yes, and given that experimental data is so difficult and expensive to come by, we um, we have developed um, simulation approaches. And simulations in the bioinformatics space have been kind of not very favorably looked at because people thought, oh, this is not experimental data, and whatever methods you are like, um, benchmarking on simulated data, they will not transfer to the real world but um but but there are um more and more vi voices um emerging in the single cell field in the structure field and us in the immune receptor field that are calling for um improved machine learning approaches so that we can be kind of a bit free from the access of limited um, experimental data and importantly, experimental data is for most of the time not ground truth because we do not know the underlying generative mechanisms of experimental data. Whereas for simulated data, um, we know how every little thing um, has been generated, which is really important for benchmarking because then you know all the noise sources, et cetera, et cetera. And this was also very nicely explained in this paper where they show that if you want to verify whether your method actually explains what you think it should explain, then you need synthetic ground truth data. So in order to simulate, in order to make a simulator for immune receptor data sets, we developed um, 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 a simulation tool, which we call uh, LIGO, and we just um, um, put, it, put this um, the paper on, uh, as a preprint on BioArchive. And um, ideally, of course, a universal adaptive immune receptor repertoire. So this is what AIR means. It just So you can just think in your head in terms of antibody or T cell receptor. Um, so the properties of such a simulator should be that it should conserve the biological properties and not break the biological properties of real world data. And that we can assimilate a very large um, immune signal complexity. So here it's important to understand, we do not know how you know, the signal of HIV looks in the antibody repertoire or the signal of, of, of SARS-CoV-2 or the signal of any autoimmune disease. But 
if we can simulate um, a very large range of different immune signals, then maybe the biological signal will be part of what we can simulate. So this is how we think about it. And there are um, a few challenges that uh, we don't want to introduce any simulation artifacts. We want to ensure biologicalness, nativeness, as we call it here. And there's also some things to figure out in terms of how we simulate. Um, and so how can we, how do we measure nativeness in for the simulator? We, we measure this by, um, so there is this concept very briefly of um, generation probability, which was developed by a group at the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure a few years ago. And what they showed is that for each immune receptor sequence, you can um, assign it a likelihood score, which they call a generation probability. And um, we use this, this generation probability as kind of a... Um, as kind of a marker for nativeness. So if we if we fundamentally change the generation probability of a certain sequence, then it's no longer native, then our signal that we introduced is no longer native, and it's probably not good to make a simulation in that way. So that's how we use very briefly um, this generation probability. And this looks very complicated and I will not stay very long on that. But basically uh, what LIGO does, what the simulation framework does, is we can simulate both immune repertoires and immune receptors. So both for the diagnostics use case and the receptor um, uh, use case and the biologics uh, use case. Um, and importantly, we help the user estimate the feasibility um, of of the simulation in terms of time, mostly. Um, there are a lot of things you can um, do in terms of data set output also. We make also sure that um, our sampling approaches for the simulation preserve the biological properties. And there we uh, just tested a, a many different sampling approaches and how they then affect downstream data. So we also did a lot of data analysis to make sure that um, yeah, our simulations are kind of meaningful and might um, transfer to, to the real world also. <clears throat> and then um, this is one use case um, that we show of how one, one might use LIGO. So here, this is for a more for a receptor-based use case where um, you have different immune signals, um, different KMERS that we implant in in, in each data set. And then um, for the machine, and then you can have different machine learning use cases. You can have a different splitting um, um, scenarios and how they would affect prediction accuracy. So this is quite a simple thing, but of course you can make this much more complex. And I will show um, later on in the talk of how the setup of um, training data set, which kind of this is, really can impact our um, conclusions of what the biological rules of binding are, for example. So this is just a slight foreshadowing on, of, of what's to come in this talk. We also um, developed um, a um, complementary simulation tool for the repertoire level where we, um, which kind of um, in addition makes even more sure that our repertoires are real world relevant. So here you see real world data where in in red, um, you see those sequences that are predictive of a given immune state. If we were not accounting for that in, in our simulations, you see that um, they would be much more overrepresented and just way too easy to catch for a given machine learning approach that we would like to benchmark. So um, we developed a simulation method that really um, accounts for that, again, based on generation probabilities and how often a sequence should occur in the repertoire and not more than it should, which is this scenario, which then looks very similar to the experimental data again. So we're really making sure that um, things are kind of correct and not that, that machine learning approaches that we would then benchmark on these data sets just don't pick up on um, simulation noise. 
And then you can do very nice things that you could never do um, in uh, experimental data. So then you can um, generate 200, uh, hundreds of thousands of immune repertoires with billions of um, immune receptor sequences and then test at, at what um, frequency of the immune signal in the repertoire you still get um, um, a high prediction um, prediction accuracy and when it um, um, goes down as a number of as a function of the number of repertoires etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can then test really really everything and this kind of also gives us an idea of um, where are the current blank spots in terms of machine learning um, capacity and where do we have to um, and in which blank areas would we have to um, develop new approaches we are also interested mostly on um, Gechettel side um, in um, coupling this with um, a causal analysis. And this is something that will soon be out um, in Nature Machine Intelligence as a perspective piece. So here the idea is that um, we always sample in these diagnostic studies from a source population. So we are already taking a sample and then there might be different um, batch effects due to different technologies that are evolved, uh, that, that have been developed or, you know, different practices in different hospitals, which then introduce batch effects into, um, into a machine learning model. And this is what we, what we kind of um, tested here again with simulated data, how if, um, if the confounded changes between training and test, how this would um, change prediction accuracy between validation and, and test data set, as well as also um, how selection bias um, can, can influence prediction accuracy. Well, um, uh, what um, I didn't really say so much, so, so with all these immune receptor data sets that we have out there and that are um, in public databases, so, so for example, the CMV data set, if I go very briefly back again um, to the study here, so therefore for each individual, we have um, hundreds of thousands of T cell receptor sequences, but we only know that this individual um, is CMV positive. We do not know what each of these um, sequences that we sequence from this individual actually bind. Maybe some of them only are um, binding to CMV and the rest is binding to something completely different. So we only have the, the label of the set of the sequences, but not the label per sequence. <clears throat> and this is what we try to overcome in, um, in this study here, where we're trying to kind of connect the diagnostics use case with biologic discovery, where we try to learn what are the sequence labels um, based on the repertoire labels. So, so here we have signal positive repertoires and using topic modeling, we um, can then identify those sequences that are actually predictive of this immune state and can also generate new sequences that are related to this immune state. So for example, you can think we have now repertoires from HIV specific individuals and we can then generate um, or we can suggest new um, antigen or HIV specific antibody candidates that uh, one could test further and maybe use as a drug later on. And this um, um, topic modeling framework, we tested both on simulated data as well as experimental data. And this is also just recently on BioArchive. So to summarize this first part, um, we um, are very interested in, um, in synthetic um, data generation that can help us develop new machine learning approaches for um, the diagnostics use case of immune receptor profiling. It, it helps us also to find the limits of, of, of current machine learning approaches. We are performing, uh, or we're very interested in the causal analysis of immune receptor classification and connecting immune repertoire profiling with actually understanding which signals in these sets of sequences are driving prediction of immune state.
And what we're currently working on is launching a, comp a public competition to know the current state of the art of how good are we actually in predicting um, immune status based on immune repertoires. And this will hopefully be online by next year, beginning of next year. So then going um, briefly to the um, sequence level, which where now the, again, the um, uh, use case is, can we predict um, binding of the antibody to the antigen shown in red? And th this is how this machine, so here we have the antibody, here we have the antigen, and you can either think of it as a sequence-based um, problem or a structure-based problem. And of course, we heard all about AlphaFold and so on. AlphaFold does not help here because it's, uh, it, it can help with structure prediction um, of the antigen, but it doesn't help with predicting which antibodies can bind a given antigen. So this protein-protein um, interaction, especially antibody-antigen interaction, um, is not yet solved. It's a, it's, and it's one of the major problems of um, immunology, I would say. And th uh, the difficulty is that it occurs in 3D. So there are uh, long range dependencies that we, that we need to resolve. And really um, what differentiates antibody antigen binding from general protein protein binding is that very similar sequences can bind the same antigen and very, very dissimilar sequences. So that are, you know, 10, 9, 11, Levenstein distance away from one another can bind the same antigen and even the same site on the antigen. So they can look very different, but bind the same antigen and they can look very similar and bind completely different antigens. And as I said before, each sequence can bind a multitude of targets and each target can be bound by a multitude of antibodies, creating this many-to-many -many binding map um, for which first we need experimental data and or simulated data to develop suitable machine learning approaches that can um, predict um, for that. So you see also from this um, what a lot of people in my field do, they kind of cluster by sequence similarity in order to um, differentiate train from test. But given these underlying biological um, realities, this is not really correct because you want very similar sequences in train and test because you want to predict um, functional difference in very similar sequences. So what we showed in um, 2021 is that there might be a common vocabulary of motif that is very common to many antibody antigen complexes, which kind of um, proved to us um, um, that antibody antigen binding could be predictable if we had more data. And um, so we set out for a simulation framework, which should, which we premised with a very simple task. We wanted that in this simulation framework, if we can, if we rank machine learning approaches by their performance, that this ranking should carry over to the real world. So whatever we benchmark in terms of performance ranking in the simulated world should carry over to um, the experimental world. So we developed this uh, simulation framework, Absolute, which was published by the end of last year. And um, very briefly, now, so this, so we take um, experimental antibody sequences and, and experimental uh, protein sequences, and we let them bind to one another in a simplified uh, 3D lattice um, with high speed docking, and which gives us... Um, a larger simulated data set than we would ever dream of, of having um, from the experimental side. So here we get 1 billion 3D structures of antibody and antigen. And just to give you the experimental, so maybe there are 10 to the 4 um, antibody antigen 
structures and now we have 10 to the 9 and we could make 10 to the 11 if we had the compute power so we are unconstrained where where the experimental data is really much constrained and we showed that our simulated data recapitulates recapitulates many of the experimental properties that we would like to have specifically the one that very similar sequences here close in space can bind um, different antigens here shown as um, different colors. So the most difficult properties of antibody sequences is preserved in our data set. And then we had to show to the reviewers, well, um, do things make sense in the simulated world? And yes, so we show that when you add sequence and structure information together, you increase prediction accuracy, just like we also saw in previous publications of us and like other people have shown this as well. And importantly, we, are, we also show that um, if we rank machine learning approaches in, in our simulated world, this ranking is preserved in the experimental world both for um, um, simple machine learning approaches as well as um, structure-based machine learning approaches. So really, um, our synthetic antibody antigen structures can guide um, machine learning methodology research for real-world antibody specificity prediction. And not only us are using Absolute now, the simulation framework, um, also other people are using it very successfully to develop their own machine learning approaches. And importantly, um, so with experimental data, mostly you can do prediction, but you can't really understand, or it's very difficult to benchmark to what extent your machine learning approaches can really recover biological rules. Here with simulated data, you can do that. Um, because we know everything, we know the binding interface, we know which residues bind to bind to one another and what's the binding energy slash affinity. So here we show if we um, take a very simple binder, non-binder prediction task, and we do not give any structure information, um, and then we apply integrated gradient to it, we see that um, the gradients um, um, cluster in the PCA space. Um, so yeah, um, by, um, so, I mean, you cannot see that here, but you have to trust me then that, that these different colors are different um, structures of, of antibodies. Um, so without giving sequence information, um, the machine learning approach kind of seems to understand different structural folds, um, which would be very difficult to see in, um, from experimental data. So that was just a, a nice um, thing to see. And then more interestingly, we already saw um, inspired um, by um, previous experimental data from other groups that um, as we change training data set um, composition is um, specifically how one defines the negative data sets, so the non-binders, if they are low affinity or very low affinity or binders to other antigens, that can really change the prediction accuracy of your model. So somehow how you put binders and non-binders together and how you define those non-binders that can change um, prediction accuracy and maybe also other things. Um, and therefore we, and this is unpublished work, we um, we took again our simulated antibody antigen binding data and we cut our data sets into binders, weak binders and non-binders based on the binding energy. And, um, and so the non-binders are called non-binder here, the weak binders are, are here, and then versus one are binders versus other antigens, but that are, um, yeah, that are, yeah, that are non-binding for us, but binding to other antigens and versus nine is um, just a mix of different binders to nine different antigens. And what, and so, so this, uh, the, so these are the negative data sets, so the non-binders overall, but defined by different binding 
energy slots or different mixtures um, against different binding entities. And you see that by the definition, we see also in our simulated data that um, prediction accuracy um, is a function of how we define our negative data set. So that's, I think, quite interesting. And um, um, this is something that we should be aware of when we use experimental data, where most of the time we do not know, for example, the binding energy. And um, what we then see is that although, um, so what what is what is apparent here is that the so um, a binding versus weak. So when we define the non-binders as just not binders, so very just below the binders. So that's the most difficult task. So which gets the the overall uh, um, lowest prediction accuracy. But we see then from this a bit complicated plot. But you need to trust me again that um, that the weak that so the the models trained on the weak versus binder um, task generalize better to let's say out of distribution. So when so when we train on binder versus weak and then apply this model to versus nine, this generalizes better than if we had trained on versus nine and then apply it to versus weak. So the in distribution um, predictive performance is lower, but the out of distribution predictive performance is um, higher. So the more difficult the task, um, the better the generalization um, capacity, which is intuitively, I guess, maybe a bit um, um, not surprising, but it's, I think, very nice to see. And, and at least from my field, the immune receptors here field, an important binding to uh, important finding to, to uh, take into account. But then, so we went even one step further because um, since we have simulated data, we can <clears throat> we can look at um, do uh, so when we have different negative data sets, um, will we also find different biological rules? And here we define biological rules as the um, affinities per amino acid of the antibody versus the antigen, which we all have since it's simulated data. And we then look at, so then we perform integrated gradient on our, um, so this is a very simple feed forward network that we always employed. And um, we, are, yeah, yeah, we, we, we apply integrated gradient on that and just then see this um, feature importance per amino acid correlate with what we would think um, or, or what we would know is the binding, is the energy contribution of this given amino acid um, to the overall binding energy. So for example, here, if R is very high, then, um, and this is, and if R also has a high binding energy contribution, then we would say that um, we recover the biological rules quite well. Um, so first, before we did that, we just compared um, the logits of the model versus the binding energy. And there we saw already that for some antigens, here shown in different colors, we have 10 different antigens, so there are 10 different colors. For some, the correlation is quite good. So for some, the logit is kind of can sense of whether um, a given sequence is high or low affinity, although we don't give any affinity information to the model. And if we then go to the per amino acid, um, to the correlation of basically this integrated gradient contributions uh, versus um, per residue affinity, we see that um, we see a difference also by the different training tasks. So um, non-binder and versus weak is better than those um, negative training um, definitions, showing that how you define your negative training, uh, yeah, how you define the negative data set impact of what you can learn biologically from the model. And we are now testing that also with um, on whether these um, conclusions hold on experimental data, but we haven't done that yet. So that's this, this is currently ongoing. 
just very briefly, I think I'm coming up to the end. Um, we are also, we have published two works on um, looking at language models and how they relate to linguistics, because um, especially in our field, but I think in most protein sequence fields, people are talking of the protein language. And, um, and here we focused on the antibody um, sequence space specifically and try to understand what is actually, um, is there really an antibody language? So can we define, uh, so can we find instances of natural language, such as a lexicon, syntactic rules, well-formed structures, compositional semantic rules, meaning also in the antibody world, just to make it more formalized, because a lot of people say, let's understand the antibody language, but what does antibody language even mean? So this we kind of formalized here, if you're interested in that, and that was a very nice collaboration with um, the linguistics department at, at our university. Um, so just to summarize this, the second part, um, so the, uh, so here I'm just showing our papers, but there are papers from other groups, obviously, as well, that have shown that there seems to be underlying rules of antibody antigen binding that um, we somehow need to understand using uh, machine learning as well as other computational approaches. I think there's a lot of work to be done on the protein language model um, field to make it less of a black box and better understand what these models learn in terms of um, antibody sequence similarity and function similarity. And, um, and there is, I think, more work to be done also in terms of domain adapted machine learning approaches for this very specific subset of biological sequences, which are immune receptor sequences. Um, yeah, I think the summary I have just said here, and again, also here, we're looking to, um, at some point, maybe in the next year, launch a comp competition also for binding prediction. Um, and we are also internally working on large scale experimental data sets, which we um, can use for training and, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, just, uh, yeah, and I think, um, Given the audience here, I think we can, there is a need for academic and industry collaboration because industry has a lot of internal data that is not shared with the outside world. So here, I think also a participation in um, hopefully in the future competitions um, would make a lot of sense. And just in general, more large scale data, better curated data. And I think this is not a problem only specific to our field, but um, many other fields. Um, that we just need better data and better curated data. It's not a very attractive um, way to um, conduct one's time, but I think um, it's it's a very useful for the machine learning community. Um, just very briefly, um, uh, um, the immune receptor community is has a society which is called Air Community. Um, um, there's also a seminar series, just like this one, where you can hear a lot of experimental and computational talks on the ongoing state of the art in immune receptor research, if you're interested in that. And if you like antibodies or T-cell receptors or want to get into this field, as it's a very hot field right now, both for machine learning and biotechnology, then there's a conference which will happen next year in June. And um, with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators, especially um, Gerhjettel, uh, my lab, um, as well as our funding um, sources. And thanks very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your talk. <clears throat> uh, that was very insightful uh, and very interesting. And um, I think we have uh, Dino right here. He has like the first questions uh, for you after after the talk, so I'll just hand over to him for that. Okay, so like my first question would be in the analysis of the synthetic data and uh, let's say existing architectures for predicting binding and interaction, what are the main shortcomings that you see in these architectures and let's say inability to learn some rules that have been encoded into the simulator? Uh, yeah. Because you have a full control over the simulator, you, you 
probably are able to tell what it is they, they cannot learn. Yeah, so I think what we have said, so to be fair, we, I mean, I, I always say we can use these simulated data to really explore all these architectures. We haven't really done a full sweep, but what we have seen so far is that I think the, the, the main thing is really to generalize to unseen sequences. So they're quite good at learning um, um, similar sequences that have similar binding, but they're very bad at generalizing to similar sequences that have different binding activity or completely different sequences. Um, so yeah, and this is really the, and, and I think the problem is really due to the biology of these immunoceptive sequences that are quite short. As you know, the binding region is 50 to 20 amino acids long, the CDR3, but, but potentially they can bind billions and billions of different targets. So there is a lot of binding space encoded in a very compact um, non-linear space. And to deconvolve this uh, will require more work. And I think, <clears throat> so the nice thing about the biology is also that it's constricted because not, not all antibodies can be made as we have seen with this generation probability. So we know that there are some um, restrictions in how antibodies can look like. I think these restrictions should be more exploited by machine learning approaches. So we need to add more prior knowledge um, to, uh, to machine learning approaches, as I think it's been done also in the physics field now, where you add a lot of physics priors. Um, uh, so I think more priors would help and what is wrong and what is right. Yeah. But also I think just yeah, I mean it's. I mean, we we're all saying it, but more experimental data to to better understand what what bio what biology can do and can't do is really important. Yeah. Mm. So, like, my second question was because like these experimental data sets are very expensive to generate, especially for the complex structures there, antigen and antibody are bound together. So, my question is like. Have you explored the potential of synthetic data for pre-training of larger models, which could then be fine-tuned uh, on the high-fidelity experimental data? And uh, does yeah. it help to do mm. that? Yeah, we haven't done that yet. I think there is some work on that in recent um, machine learning conferences in these uh, structure, especially in the sub-structure um, workshops of NeurIPS, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think they have shown much, much success since the data, the experimental data is really, the structural data is really not a lot. I mean, there's, um, and the complexity is so large, fine tuning on a few hundred structures, I don't know if it really helps. Um, what I think for now is a better route to go is, for example, creating large scale deep mutational scanning data sets where you just sweep through or screen through a lot of different variants of different antibodies just to see which mutations lead to increased binding and um, decreased binding and then couple this to structure. Um, I think that would that's a more viable way to go and deep mutation scanning. You see a lot of papers with this now coming out both in the antibody field and the general protein field. This seems to spark a lot of new um, discoveries now. So I think that's the way to go. Yeah. Mm. I have one more, yeah. uh, if I can. Uh, so like in these talking setups, how much control can you exert on the sequences that are similar, but functionally very diff uh, different? Because those are kind of activity cliffs that are characteristic for drug design, both small molecule and large molecule world. Uh, and how easy is it is to simulate it and then, then see how easy or difficult it is to model them? Uh, in terms of the amount of the data and and, and uh, that's required. So that's also, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, this is also one ongoing uh, work that we want to look into because we always get asked how many sequences do you need for a given machine learning task. Um, so this is something that we want to look into now of, of, of how many sequences would one need 
um, to solve a given machine. So what's the, and I think simulation approaches can give us a lower bound. So at least X amount of sequences are necessary for that and that binding prediction task. Um, I, I, I think that's what we should strive for. And if we see that this X amount is 20 million sequences, then maybe we should move to other machine learning tasks first because yeah, just to gauge feasibility and maybe then for some tasks, we really just need to wait for the next technological advance to, to come around the corner. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And um, we have a question from Kerstin, if you want to um, ask a question directly here. Yes. Um, hi. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, so we have been looking at SARS-CoV-2 immunity and using single cell sequencing to define paired TCR uh, repertoires that actually um, and have actually identified public clonotypes. And I was really just wondering how likely it would be you think that these kind of interactions could be refound in your simulated data. Yeah, so uh, these public um, chronotypes are, can be readily simulated. So that's, um, that's yeah, yeah. It's almost that um, they are sometimes simulated too often. So that's why I said in this one simulator, we don't want to have them too many times because we want to have them in a, in a native um, proportion because they don't occur that often. And, and I mean, for SARS-CoV-2, we were quite um lucky i mean the, the the world kind of because there are quite a lot of shared clonotypes across individuals but for example in autoimmunity uh, where the antigen is much more complex and not even known most of the time um it's much more difficult to find them and thus also under finding underlying patterns that can help us predict so that's why that's why most of the diagnostics field has focused on like CMV and these kind of things because it's a it's an it's an infection, which creates a large response. But for these very low signal chronic infections, um, it's kind of the dirty truth of our field that we always tell everybody adaptive immunity remembers everything, but we can't really find it yet. So, so this is this is the problem. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. And do we have any more questions for uh, Victor? If that is not the case, um, thank you very much again for, for talking uh, for us today. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the audience to, to come. The recording of this talk will be online um, at sometime next week as well. Um, please tell colleagues, friends, whoever will be interested in our seminar series to sign up um, on our website for future talks, which we will um, make public from next week onwards as well. And um, thank you again, Victor. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I wish you all a good rest of the day and a nice weekend. Thank you.